All right, good afternoon. Do uh, you want the good news or the good news? Good news is that the Secretary General will speak to you at the stakeout tomorrow, 12.30 p.m. Uh, he'll have, make some remarks. He will take a few questions. Uh, the better news is that I will not brief. The even better news is that we will suspend the briefings on, uh, for next week, uh, so we will be posting highlights. We will be in the office if you need to find us, uh, though please don't look for us. Uh, and... Uh, Briefings will resume uh, on the 2nd of January, probably with either Steph probably with Stephanie and Stephanie and Florencia will brief next week. Um, the following week. Sorry, the, the week of January. So we'll we I, I will be here. We'll, we'll be in the, uh, in the office, uh, and then uh, Stephanie and Florencia will brief the first week of January. Anyway, uh, so that's all the good news I have for you, uh, because the rest is all pretty depressing. Um, turning to Gaza, um, I can tell you that we're working with all involved to ensure that the flow of goods into Gaza is sufficient, predictable, swift, and swift and delivered um, and based on what people need most. While the current scale of supplies entering Gaza falls short of what is required, what is equally crucial is to reestablish the conditions within Gaza that allow for meaningful, efficient, and large-scale humanitarian deliveries. Currently, intense fighting, the lack of electricity, limited fuel, and disrupted telecommunications severely restrict access to loading points and to trucks, as well as to the ability to deliver, prioritize, plan, and coordinate critical operations with civilians uh, bearing uh, the brunt of uh, the suffering that is going on. Yesterday, the Israeli military designated a new uh, area covering about 20% of central and south Khan Yunis city for immediate evacuation. Uh, those areas were marked uh, on an online map published on social media. Prior to the onset of the hostilities, the area was home to about 111,000 people. The area also includes 32 shelters that accommodated more than 141,000 displaced men, women, and children, the vast majority of whom were previously displaced from the north. The Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tells us that access to evacuation information on Khan Yunus and other key information, uh, information is impaired by the interruptions in telecommunications and, of course, the lack of electricity. Telecommunications are still down in most of Gaza for the eighth day in a row. On the health front, uh, the World Health Organization led a mission yesterday together with staff from the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs to deliver medical supplies to Al-Hali and Shifa hospitals in <laughs> Gaza City. Uh, this is uh, one of the few humanitarian convoys to reach areas north of Wadi Gaza since the end of the humanitarian pause on December 1st. Only nine out of 36 facilities are partially functioning, uh, excuse me, nine out of 36 health facilities are partially functional in the whole of Gaza. All of them are in the south. That's according to the World Health Organization. The hospitals in the north are still sheltering thousands of displaced people. And according to a food security analysis issued today, more than half a million people are facing catastrophic hunger conditions in Gaza. The World Food Program warns that these levels of acute food insecurity are unprecedented in recent history and that Gaza risks famine. The analysis issued by the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification and includes data from the World Food Program, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and many other UN agencies, as well as international NGOs, confirm that the entire population of Gaza, that's roughly 2.2 million people, are in crisis or worse levels of acute food insecurity. It further highlights that 26% of Gazans, that's more than half a million people, have exhausted their food supplies and coping capacities and face catastrophic hunger uh, and starvation. WFP has been calling for the situation, has been calling the situation desperate, and no one is safe, uh, in Gaza is safe from starvation, they say. That's why we've, they've been, we've all been calling for an 
immediate humanitarian ceasefire, the opening of all border crossings, and the resumption of commercial cargo to provide relief and put an end to the suffering. Also, uh, I want to flag to you another uh, tragic humanitarian uh, situation which we uh, have to keep in the news, and that is what is going on in Al Jazeera State in Sudan. According to the International Organization for Migration, um, up to 300,000 people have fled uh, Wad Madani in Al Jazeera State in a new wave of large-scale displacement after the fighting spread to the area. The UN Children Fund warns that at least 150,000 children were forced from their homes in less than one week, 150,000. These latest movements will push Sudan's total displacement population to 7.1 million people, the world's largest displacement crisis. More than 1.5 million people have fled into neighboring countries. Um, since the onset of the crisis, the International Organization for Migration has been delivering essential life-saving aid to about 660,000 people in Sudan and neighboring country. For its part, UNICEF and its partners have also worked to provide life-saving assistance to over 6 million children in Sudan and in the neighboring countries that are hosting uh, refugees, and that includes uh, delivery of water, health, nutrition, safe space, and uh, learning facilities. As we've been telling you, all humanitarian field missions within and from Al Jazeera State have been suspended, jeopardizing the already fragile deliv delivery of critical aid to 270,000 men, women, and children in need within Wad uh, Madani, Sudan's second largest city and the displaced population fleeing the ongoing violence according to Sudan's humanitarian response plan. Access to the basic necessities such as food and health care have been severely disrupted while nearly 25 million people require humanitarian assistance and protection. Uh, as you know, our friend Jean-Pierre Lacroix, the head of the peacekeeping department, is continuing his travels to uh, the Central African Republic. This morning he went to Birao in the country's northeast together with the Minister of Interior of the Central African Republic and the head of the UN peacekeeping mission, Valentin Rugwabiza. They interacted with the local population and also visited Sudanese refugee at the Corsi site. Uh, Mr. Lacroix paid tribute to the resilience and generosity of Central Africans and the authorities towards the refugees and praise the collaboration between the mission and humanitarians who are continuing to provide assistance to people who are crossing the border. Ms. Rugwabiza noted that peacekeepers will continue to provide, to patrol the area, to provide protection, responding to concerns of the local population on the need to secure border areas such as Amdafok and uh, Tisfongoro. She announced that patrols to secure these areas would be carried out before the end of the year. Back in the capital in Bangui, Mohamed Ag Ayoya, the humanitarian coordinator for Central African Republic, allotted uh, $13 million to address the most urgent needs of about 150,000 internally displaced people, as well as returnees and host communities. This allocation from the Central African, Rep uh, Central African Republic Humanitarian Fund will assist the most vulnerable in the southeast of the country and others in hard-to-reach areas and underserved areas where thousands of people need vital support, including health, nutrition, shelter, and clean water. The region, particularly the Om uh, Obubu Prefecture, has seen the humanitarian security situation worsen since March amid clashes between armed groups. The humanitarian coordinator called on the parties to protect civilians, uphold their obligations under international humanitarian law. The turning to Guinea-Bissau, the Secretary General is following developments in Guinea-Bissau with concern. He calls on all parties to respect the Constitution and to engage in constructive dialogue towards the resolution of their political differences. The special representative of the Secretary General for West Africa and the Sahel, Leonardo Shimao, is liaising closely with relevant stakeholders and is ready to engage with the country's political leadership and other relevant uh, parties in collaboration with ECOWAS and other international players. 
And um, just back here, the Security Council this morning, our special envoy for Syria, Ger Pedersen, wrapped up the year with a message. He said that 2024 is in 20, excuse me, that in 2024, there is a clear need to refocus on the political process, which was called for eight years ago in Resolution 2254. He added that this, his good offices are ongoing with the Syrian parties, the regional players, and international stakeholders in this regard. Briefing on the humanitarian situation was Lisa Doughton, the Director of Humanitarian Finance Recourse Mobilization at OCHA, reminded members of the importance of ensuring Bab al Salam and al Rey and Bab al Hawa crossings remain open. She said, in the coming days, we will formally request that the government of Syria extends its con consent for the use of the border crossing for as long as humanitarian needs uh, persist. Um, and we have no money to announce today, but I couldn't end the year without another little quiz for you. Um, I'm going to read out some names to you, and you'll tell me what world day this is. Fournier, Parker, went by Nayama, and Koulibaly. It's World Basketball Day, the first one. And I read out the names of four French people who played, who play, who are play, who played in the NBA. I was trying to make it a little challenging. Uh, today is indeed World Basketball Day, the first of its kind. Um, uh, as you know, uh, basketball is a global grassroots sports and played and enjoyed people of all ages and skill levels from organized leagues to casual pickup games. And there was a very interesting round table this morning with the original Dr. J, Julia Serving, that was organized by the Mission of the Philippines. Uh, okay, let's get back uh, to business. Uh, questions, Edie. Um, thank you, Steph. With virtually the entire population of Gaza in food crisis and 577,000 people in Gaza starving, um, how important is it that the Security Council adopt a new resolution to spur aid deliveries? Look, the, the, the Council is in deep discussion, uh, not, uh, so not particularly helpful for us to, uh, to, get, uh, to, to get involved. Uh, obviously, what we would want to see is something that would facilitate the, you know, the immediate, safe, and unhindered delivery of humanitarian aid. And on Sudan, um, I know the UN humanitarian effort is still underway, but what about talk of any new political mission in the country, or is that dead for the moment? Well, I mean, the the political mission as it existed, uh, Unitoms, as you know, uh, is as you described it. Um, Mr. Lamamra, who the Secretary General named as his personal envoy, is currently in New York. Uh, I, I met with him yesterday. He will be going to the region uh, very soon in the new year uh, to engage with uh, national and, and regional uh, leaders. And then we'll be reporting back to the Secretary General and, uh, and the Security Council. Amelie. Thanks, Steph. Uh, the Israeli, coming back on, on Gaza and the aid, uh, the Israeli president earlier today said that unfortunately, due to a decisive failure of the UN, they are unable to bring more than 120 trucks a day, uh, and that it's impossible to provide the, the amount uh, of humanitarian aid into Gaza. Uh, that in, if the UN, instead of complaining all day, would do its job. Uh, any kind of comment? Look, uh, the, the most helpful thing for the delivery of humanitarian aid in a sustained, high-volume way would be a, a humanitarian ceasefire immediately, right? Uh, because it is not only getting trucks in, it is also uh, being able to deliver safely. Uh, the UN and, and the UN system as a, as a whole is focused on trying to get as much aid in as possible, as quickly as possible. Right, uh, we are working in highly 
dangerous situation. More than 135 of our colleagues have paid uh, for, their, for their lives. Uh, we're working in a highly complicated uh, system uh, where different verifications have to go uh, in. And then we saw, you know, we saw today um, uh, a drone uh, a strike on, uh, you know, on the Palestinian side of the other crossing of Karuma Abu Salem, uh, which led to UNRWA uh, right now being unable to receive trucks that go in. Uh, and we had, we were, we understand a number of uh, uh, Palestinians who were working at the at the crossing uh, were killed, and we had by by chance uh, a, a number of UNRWA colleagues had been there uh, not long before, um, but they could also have been hit. Uh, WFP temporarily suspended its operations there. I understand they've now uh, they've now resumed. Uh, Benno, then Michelle. And then Pam. Thank you, Steph. I think I have three questions. First, um, just from my understanding, you said uh, WFP says the food insecurity levels are unprecedented in recent history. Uh, do you mean for the region or in uh, recent world history? It's, I mean, uh, I, you see the difference, right? I do see the difference. I would ask you to uh, get in touch with WFP here to provide more context. I think one of the issues here is uh, is the rapid is how rapidly the situation deteriorated. Um, and then the second one, uh, the new designated area for civilians to flee in Gaza. What's your assessment? How safe this area is right now? Well, I think our position from the beginning, I mean, is that no area in Gaza is safe. Okay, and. As it's one of your last briefings this year, uh, how many countries did actually pay their uh, dues this year and who is missing? You were supposed to be, well. Yeah, I can't you, keep track with. Uh, I know, it's hard, they're big numbers. I know, Benno. Uh, um, you, you will see on our website the list of all the countries that have paid. You can do the deduction of those who haven't paid in full. And, and let me just put it this way. A number of countries partially pay uh, but the ones that are listed are those paid in, um, in full. It's about 151, and my colleagues will correct me before the end of the briefing if that's wrong. 141. There you go. Deji works for us here. Michelle, <laughs> you're not getting any money, though. Um, just uh, on the delivery of aid to Gaza, um, how would you assess the current monitoring system of aid going into Gaza? Is it Does it... Oh, well. <laughs> it's the last briefing of the year. You can answer. No, no, go for um, it. You tell me. It, it's complex, right? I mean, we're dealing, uh, we have to deal with different, uh, different parties. We're trying to bring humanitarian aid into a live conflict zone. Uh, it is complex. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, the ideally, uh, if there were less burdens and there was no fighting, more aid could go in. But I will leave it at that. And um, to what you said earlier about the need to facilitate the immediate, safe and unhindered delivery of humanitarian aid, does the United Nations think that having a third party lead a monitoring mechanism would help that? I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, dive in uh, between member states, members of the council, as they are negotiating a resolution. What? It was just a question. You didn't mention the council. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, Deji, you were correct. Uh, Pam, it is 141. Pam. Uh, thanks. Just on the vote and on the resolution and on OP4, um, is the UN or anyone at the UN discussing the monitoring mechanism with Egypt, for example, today? And how would you describe, I mean, I know the Secretary General, we all know the Secretary General wrote a letter on options for the monitoring mechanism. How would you describe the, the monitoring mechanism as it exists in the resolution? Well, there is no resolution yet. No, so I'm I can't, sorry, in the draft. Uh, I, that, okay. I, please don't okay. drag me into that quicksand. <laughs> and Thank on you. Egypt? On Egypt, I, I mean, we, we are not involved in the, in, we are not 
the Secretariat is not a pen holder on this resolution. So we, we you know, I, I see what you see, I read what you read. We understand there are all sorts of discussions uh, going on. Uh, let's see what comes out and then we'll be able to speak. Uh, Abdel Hamid, then Mushfik. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Today, the Israeli Foreign Minister, Eli, Eli Cohen, said that his country will uh, assassinate Hamas leader Khalid Mashal and uh, Ismail Haniyeh, even if it takes 10 years to assassinate them. Any comment on this statement? I have not seen that statement. I have not seen. I haven't seen that statement. But as you know, we stand uh, against uh, any sort of extrajudicial executions. Your other question, sir. My, my second question: Israel is establishing its own Guantanamo Bay. At least one thousand Palestinians were kidnapped from their homes, hospitals, shelters, ho uh, schools. Some of them are nurses, doctors. Uh, humanitarian workers, etc. And uh, do you have any comment? Do you have more information about this development? Uh, we have uh, expressed our concern at the, the level of administrative detainees and our position on that, which has been expressed numerous times, remains unchanged. Uh, can, can, can we call these people uh, hostages? Uh, I, I'm not going to get. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to get into labeling business. Uh, I said we've we've talked about the issue of administrative detainees, uh, and we've expressed our, our opinion on them. Uh, Mushfik. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Stefan, and happy holidays to you and all of my colleagues. According to media and international rights group report, Bangladesh regime is fully prepared for a one-sided one election, which will take place in January 7, putting all oppositions in the jail. According to Voice of America report, six people died in the custody in the last two weeks. So still you will urge for a free, fair election, a credible election, or Secretary General can take any personal initiative to return back to democracy as people are you know, very much uh, willing to see the international community's action for democracy and human Mushfik, rights. I've, uh, Mushfik, I've, I've, an I mean, I, uh, I, I've answered your your questions uh, before, and as you as you preempted part of my answer, that we do call for free and fair elections where people can can vote freely without any sort of intimidation. Uh, obviously, we may have things to say after the uh, after the elections, but our our position remains unchanged. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I have another question from uh, Jehangir. Thank you so much. Uh, do you hear me clear? Yes, sir. Thank you and uh, happy holidays. Uh, my name is Dastagir Jehangir from Shamoy in News TV from Bangladesh. I have a concern only about a wave of arson attacks on buses full of passengers. And on December 19th, four people, including a woman and a three-year-old child, were burned alive after arsonists set on fire three coaches of the Dhaka-bound express train. Are you concerned about the victims falling prey to such arson attack on political violence free well, general well, election? Please, thank you for the comments. We, we uh, extend our condolences to all those who perished in that horrific, uh, horrific fire. I think it is incumbent on the the authorities in Bangladesh to fully uh, investigate uh, the source and uh, to bring those responsible to justice. Mike. It's my last question of the year. I apologize for the long-windedness. Part of the reason- <laughs> You're not the first. I know. Part of the reason of all the nonsense this week at the Security yeah. Council is Israel's lack of trust in the United Nations. Just within the last few days, a high-ranking UN women official deleted her Twitter and LinkedIn account after it was found 150 some tweets and other postings completely biased against Israel. A United Nations, uh, the Twitter account from the UN tweeted out a release highlighting humanitarian aid crossing over from Jordan to Gaza, neglecting to mention the country in between that facilitated that delivery. And the UN also tweeted out an OSHA uh, report uh, highlighting, rightfully so, the plight of 64,000 South Lebanese citizens who are displaced, failing to mention the 80,000 Israeli 
citizens who are displaced because of that same conflict, failing to mention Hezbollah's firing indiscriminately into Israel, mentioning, though, Israel's response in that report. Is, is this not a, it's a pattern. Is this not a problem? I, I don't, well, I don't believe it's a pattern. I think uh, to take, uh, uh, to take your, your questions uh, backwards, my sense on the OCHA uh, report that they were focusing on areas in which they are present, in which they work. Uh, the UN on the humanitarian end works in areas, in countries uh, that need, that request the UN's humanitarian assistance, and OCHA has a presence there. It's not, uh, so they were talking about where, they, where they're operating. Uh, on the issue of the, of the tweet, uh, it was unfortunate to say the least, and it's been corrected. Uh, on the issue of the UN woman staffer who used her personal account, uh, I understand UN women is dealing with the issue that there was a violation of the code uh, of, the code of conduct uh, by this individual and is being uh, dealt with. For the Secretary General, it has been clear, and he's said it since the first time he's been asked, that Israel is a full member of this organization with the same rights and the same responsibilities as the other 192. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thanks for all you do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Linda. Thank you, Steph. I have a question about UN monitoring of the goods going in um, to, the, to Gaza. As I understand, the SG's proposal is for just the UN exclusively to inspect the goods. And if so, um, the Black Sea Initiative deal, I believe, allowed Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, and the UN to you know, inspect the ships. So. I, I th listen, I think we can do a lot of compare and contrast. I think the, and I, I'm not going to, the, what, what was going on in, what is going on in the Black Sea, what is going on in Gaza uh, are different, uh, different situations demand different solutions. Deji. So this is your last briefing this year, so I'm, I feel. It, I mean, it, I'll tell I'll you something. If you see me on the podium next week, it would be only bad news. Okay, which is why I'm going to ask you these questions. New questions. First one, do you have any update on the withdrawal of MINUSMA? Because this is your last briefing of this year, and the, that mission well, is supposed they, to they, end Well, uh, as of uh, December 31st, they enter into the liquidation phase, which means there will be a core uh, group of staff members that are staying behind, as well as some guard units, to ensure the liquidation of the, of, of the, uh, of the mission. I think, um, you know, MINUSMA has been... Uh, a mission that has accomplished a lot. They have, uh, over their 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Deji, um, they have protected uh, hundreds of thousands of civilians in the areas in which they, they operated. They've allowed for the delivery of humanitarian good. Um, and UN peacekeepers uh, have paid the ultimate price in that mission more than in any other mission in an effort uh, to protect uh, men, women, and children uh, who were living in very, very difficult circumstances, both humanitarian and political, and facing uh, acts of, uh, of violence uh, from various uh, armed groups and others. And I think we can all be very proud of what MINUSMA has achieved. So. My one last question, what do you think is the biggest achievement for the United Nations in 2023? That I still have a job. Okay, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. All right, thank you. Happy you too, Happy take care, bye. Oh, I do, I do, I raised my hand, sorry, okay, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, you can't, I'm gonna uh, this let is a perfect a end to the briefing. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> according to the World Health Organization, Stefan, um, there are only nine hospitals that are partially yeah. functioning out of 36 in Gaza. And an analysis of differing uh, news reports suggests that hospital in Gaza may be subjected to a repeated pattern of intimidation, direct targeting, uh, siege, and occupation by the Israeli military. So I'm this is considered to be a war crime what, what, under what is the question? normal conditions. So are you, uh, is the UN following the unfolding of these attacks? And do you think these deserve a special attention by the UN? Thank you. I mean, we, 
I mean, Sharif, we've been talking about this and leading the briefing with this since the beginning of this crisis. So I think we're paying a lot of attention. Um, WHO, as I just read out earlier, has been very much focused on the hospital as it is within their, uh, their remit. We have said over and over again that hospitals need to be protected. They cannot be used in combat. They cannot be targeted. They cannot be used as a source of combat. And we will continue to focus on that. Thank you. I have I have been reporting on that since. No, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Telling me, and but I'm just wondering if the UN sees this kind of a pattern. That's they, they been will unfolding. need to be after this conflict is. They will need to be accountability. Thank you. Thanks. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.